agenda this evening so everybody knows what we have to do. Uh, the first item uh, under old business is the Carew subdivision, a request for minor subdivision review and public hearing. Under new business, the Goldcrest Trails request for recess protection permit. <coughs> Uh, then the request by Sprague Corporation for site plan review for the Spurwink River boat dock. Then a request by Wiley Enterprises for an amendment to the previously approved latent subdivision. And then a request by Peter and Jennifer McFarland for a private access way permit. So that's the agenda. First item is Approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of May 20th, 2003. Yes. I move that the minutes be accepted as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay. Um, I want to identify the correspondence. We have a letter from M. Guthrie, read the Fort Williams master plan. A letter from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust regarding Goldcrest uh, and the Shoreland Zoning News, spring of 2003. A memorandum from the Conservation Commission regarding the crew subdivision. And a letter from the town attorney, June 17, 2003. Um, before we start our first Agenda item, I was asked to remind everyone that there will be the following public hearings at our next regular meeting of July 15th. There will be a public hearing on the miscellaneous amendments to the subdivision road and zoning ordinances on the Fort Williams zoning ordinance amendment to delete the southern subdistrict and a public hearing on the Fort Williams draft master plan with proposed amendments to the Southwest Preserve. So, uh, so everybody can plan their calendars. That's, those are all the public hearings on July 15th. Okay. Uh, we can start with the crew subdivision. Maybe you can bring us up to date as to where we are sure. since last time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, and I represent uh, Candace Carew, and who is with us this evening, and along with uh, Candace's brother, Jack Hilk, who also is a uh, part owner in, in the subdivision proposal. Uh, I'd like to briefly, uh, I, once again, just uh, give a quick presentation of the existing conditions and then get into the uh, proposed subdivision plan. The property is a 7.8 acre property uh, located at 246 Ocean House Road. Uh, the site is bounded on the north <coughs> by vacant land owned by Peggy Chinchette, um, on the east and south by single family residences and on the west by Ocean House Road. There is a single family residence and a barn uh, currently located on the, on the property. Uh, the, the land generally slopes in a northerly direction towards, uh, uh, towards a RP2 wetland and RP1 wetland. There's a small drainage soil that extends up just beyond the property line um, consisting of RP1 wetlands um, and we have created the 250 foot setback from the edge of that RP1 setback uh, wetland. The, the, uh, the site is, is primarily characterized by large open fields particularly in the front uh, there's a lower field and an upper field separated by a deciduous row of vegetation. 
Uh, in this corner of the property is an old apple orchard, and the balance of the site uh, along the eastern boundary is, is vegetated with a mix of uh, soft and hardwoods. There's a, a nice stand of evergreens uh, which run along Ocean House Road. <coughs> The, this, with regard to zoning and density, uh, we have used the provisions of the, or, the open space uh, zoning provisions of the ordinance uh, to cluster this proposed subdivision. Um, in calculating the maximum density under, the, under your ordinance, we have taken the unsuitable, <coughs> excuse me, the unsuitable land consisting of the actual right-of-way of the, of the roadway, uh, the RP1 wetland. Uh, there's a small area <coughs> where there's a pond uh, located here. Uh, there's an easement that runs along the northerly property line. We've taken that area and totaled all those areas up, um, which equals 30,500 square feet. We've subtracted that from the gross acreage to come up with a net residential acreage of 7.12 acres. <clears throat> We've taken that and applied the 66,000 square foot per lot um, under the open space zoning ordinance and we come out with a, an allowable density of 4.7 lots or four lots. The uh, We're proposing three lots, uh, one of which is the existing residence. Lot one is located in this area here between Ocean House Road and the existing residence. Um, that is a little over 30,000 square feet. Lot two is the existing residence. That equals 56,600 square feet. And lot three is located here, um, and that equals 31,700 square feet. Uh, we've maintained the existing curb cut at Ocean House Road for our uh, private drive. We've extended the drive up to this point <clears throat> approximately 320 feet with a hammerhead turnaround at the end. Uh, this is uh, designed as a private, privately owned and maintained roadway uh, built to town standards uh, except for the road width. We're proposing 18 versus 20. I'll get into that a little, a little later on. <clears throat> um, the open space, uh, the ordinance requires at least 40% under the cluster zoning ordinance to be put into common open space. Uh, we have a total of 4.17 acres or 53%. And of that 40%, at least a third has to be usable. Uh, we have 2.9 ac acres that is usable or 71 percent. So we, uh, we exceed the minimum standards uh, with regard to open space. We've also uh, are proposing a conservation easement and trail easement, uh, which is a draft of which is included in your, in your packet. Uh, basically, this will incorporate the open space, the, the common open space, into a conservation easement uh, al along with um, allowing a trail to be constructed sometime in the future when and if a connection can be made between Ocean House Road and Robinson Woods, which is to the east of this property. And our attorney, Jeff Hall, and, uh, and the town attorney, Mike Hill, has been, been working on the language, and I believe that Mike has approved um, and signed off on the, uh, the final draft of that easement. Uh, stormwater management, the your town ordinance and uh, as well as the state stormwater standards uh, encourage infiltration of stormwater um, and this, this site in this project really lends itself uh, to that approach. Basically all of the the, the, the stormwater from um, the upper reaches of this watershed uh, are intercepted with a 
by a swale and a catch basin structure at this point is directed into a level lip spreader located just outside the 250 foot uh, buffer and at that point it discharges over the, the open space. Um, and there's, a, there's approximately 200 feet between the level lip spreader and the edge of the RP2 wetland for that storm water to infiltrate back into the, uh, the groundwater. Utilities, uh, we're proposing a four inch uh, water uh, and a six inch sewer line and underground electric telephone and cable utilities. <clears throat> We are, as we indicated in our, in our uh, cover letter, we're, we're proposing or requesting, I should say, uh, three waivers. The first is to place or reduce the 75-foot uh, setback on lot one to 50 feet. Uh, the open space zoning uh, requires a 75-foot setback in this location here. <clears throat> I believe the planning board does have the authority to reduce that as long as what we're proposing meets the underlying zone, which, which it does, we're proposing 50 feet. We're also um, preserving, we've got a note on the plat plan that preserves the existing <coughs> vegetation out there. The second waiver uh, we are requesting to increase the, the percent grade at the entrance. Uh, we have a very, <clears throat> We've got a 20, 24 inch culvert located at the entrance that was just uh, newly installed by the state. We've got minimal cover over that. If we were to excavate that entrance to the required 3% grade, uh, we would have practically no cover at all over that culvert. <clears throat> Uh, so we are asking for a reduction or to increase the percent grade from 3 to 5 percent for the first 10 feet of the entrance. Uh, it will also minimize the dis disruption of this, of the root system of this 36 inch oak tree. And the final waiver is to uh, reduce the width of the road pavement from 20 to 18 feet. Um, and we feel that this is appropriate for this, uh, for this development uh, for the following reasons. That an 18 foot width of roadway pavement plus a two foot grass slash gravel shoulder on each side for a total width of 22 feet will provide adequate travel area for emergency vehicles as well as accommodate maintenance vehicles including snow storage. Number two, the road will only be serving three lots Number three, the road is a private road which will be owned and maintained by the three homeowners. Number four, a narrow pavement width will help to maintain the unique and rural character of the town and is more appropriate for a three lot subdivision. Uh, number five, a narrow pavement will help to reduce the speed limit of vehicles. And finally, uh, an 18 foot wide pavement width will help to reduce the impact on existing mature trees. There's a 36 uh, inch oak tree that I referred to at the entrance. Uh, there are 24 inch plus spruce trees along the road uh, side lines. And there is a 60 inch ash tree opposite the existing residence that uh, uh, for those of you who are at site visit, uh, it's quite a specimen uh, ash tree. So for those reasons, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to keep the pavement width to a minimum. Uh, as far as the technical issues are concerned, I think we've addressed all of Steve Harding's uh, issues. Um, he did call today, I, I did call him and he had, uh, there are two very minor labeling issues that uh, have to go on the, the uh, detail sheet, which we'll do. And <clears throat> Finally, the conditions. Um, in Maureen's uh, memo, uh, she has a list of five conditions, and uh, we agree to, to all of them except for condition number two. Um, 
we feel basically that it's somewhat restrictive, uh, especially in a cluster subdivision um, for to restrict activities uh, other than driveways, utilities, or removal of diseased uh, vegetation. And it's not to say that we're going to go in and clear cut those areas outside the building envelope, uh, but as, as I studied the plan uh, with relation to that note, this lot here may require going in just outside the building envelope for grading purposes. Um, it is a fairly small building envelope as, as lot one is, um, <clears throat> but we just felt that it was a bit too restrictive for this situation. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Um, we're going to go ahead and open the public hearing, and then we'll be back uh, to you. Uh, right now, there's been a public hearing noticed for tonight, so I'll open the public hearing. Anyone would like to speak, please approach the lectern. And if you can just identify yourself and where you live. Uh, my name is Eric Chiquette, and my wife and family and I live right here. And I uh, just a few questions. Um, I wish I wasn't here, but um, I've been, uh, I'm confused with the, with the, uh, with the rules. We lived there 14 years, and I was under the impression that I guess it's changed. But you had to have 200 feet of frontage on on the main road to have to have a house lot. And so when that property was sold, we thought it was only going to be one house. But then we were told that it was going to be it was permitted to do a cluster housing in it. And so then I didn't realize that. But anyway, I guess it is eligible for cluster housing. And then the third thing is, we were told that this is going to be, uh, for the developers, it was a family compound. And so I didn't have any problem with that. But then I find out that this, it isn't what it's going to be. It's, this is, I've been told, I don't know, but I've been told that this house is, is a spec house. And I, I really don't have a problem with the developer developing their property, but um, I think that lot, there's, there's, some other, there's other locations for it on the site that, that uh, the developer could have it. it. Would be more in keeping with cluster. I mean, this you could build this house down here. That way, it would be a, a real cluster. This is I don't know how far this is from here to here, but it's it's more than a cluster uh, when I think of a cluster. Um, but uh, all in all, I really you know I hate speaking about any of the property because but. It just concerns us. We've been there a long time, and you know, having that house stuck, you know, right back up against us is just something that obviously we didn't want. Um, and I, I didn't realize you could do it. And so I'm just, uh, I wish you'd take that all into consideration. I mean, I don't wish any harm to the developer at all, but I think if you refigure that back lot, maybe put it down like a real cluster. It would save them some money in infrastructure. It wouldn't be as much paving, and it would it would satisfy the cluster uh, subdivision requirement. Um, but again, I don't wish any anything ill or anything. I it's their property, but it's just a selfish thing. It's not in my backyard. I guess is my problem, and my wife's problem, my kids' problems. But um, anyway, I don't know. I'm not very good at this, but. That's our concerns, anyway, as the, as the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chinguet. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? OK, um, close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Mitchell, if you could. Uh, we can uh, ask the board if they have have questions, uh, perhaps you can address uh, some of the Mr. Chinquette's questions or concerns uh, regarding the 
frontage and some of the other issues if, if you'd like, just so he knows. Well, the frontage requirements for a cluster zoning is 150, 125 feet. Yes, you can help if you would like, Maureen. The, the RA district had a frontage requirement of 200 feet and it was changed in 1997 to 125 feet. In addition, this is a cluster development, so it can go as low as 50 feet. But you have to worry about the Perkins decisions implications. So the underlying zoning setback uh, frontage requirement is 125, 125. feet. Um, with regard to putting a house here, uh, <clears throat> we did look at that. And with this 250 foot setback and the road, you know, we have a, a 50 foot setback here, 30 foot setback here, 30 here in the 250, it just reduced the building envelope to a, to a size that you couldn't really build a suitable uh, or an average size home. <clears throat> and uh, I, think, I think along with that, it would, it would impact on, I mean, it would take away from the visual impact of driving along Ocean House Road that you, you have a, a nice open field vista now and uh, certainly a house there would uh, have an impact, visual impact. So for those, uh, for those reasons, we eliminated a, putting a house there. Um, you know, there, there is a, you know, we, we've looked at this out on the site. There is a, a, a fairly good um, buffer right here and uh, which we don't intend to to clear intend to preserve it um, to provide Eric and his wife um, a buffer Does the board have questions of Mr. Mitchell who would Andy first of course with regard to the uh, easement that's been discussed and, and negotiated between the town attorney and the developer's attorney, part of the correspondence we received tonight was a letter from the town attorney saying uh, he thinks there should still be some changes. So were this to be voted on tonight, do we need a condition that clarifies that? And if so, how would that? Because it looks like it's not done is the way I'm reading it. Well, we can uh, we can reference. Uh, I think the way it's written is it has to be to the satisfaction of the town's attorney. Okay. Well, Mr. So, Sherman pointed out to me there is a condition in the draft motion already, but I guess for clarification, it, it looks like they're pretty close, but there are still some technicalities. That right. And uh, as I said, uh, Jeff Hall, Anderson's attorney, was working uh, with Mike Hill today in addressing all of these, and I thought that he had signed off on it. Uh, that the it copy that I delivered to you today was uh, addressed all of these. I haven't, got, I haven't heard from Mike Hill, though. Okay. It sounds like you've gotten this letter, and your attorney has accepted all the changes, and he's doing them right now. Right, yes. So I, we're, I think if we're we, on the same page. If we condition it on the town attorney's approval, then when he sees it, and if all the changes have been made, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, I had two other quick questions. On the, the uh, road width, there's a current ordinance standard that says 20 feet paved. Uh, there's actually been discussion in the board about increasing that number, um, and you're proposing 18 feet paved with shoulders. What would your attitude be towards a condition that said, should the road ever be presented to the town for acceptance as a public road, that it would be, it would have to be widened to whatever the standard was at that time at the developer's expense. So we assumed that that would be the case. Okay. Yes. Which I'm a little uncomfortable waving down something that's about to go up, but I also think we need to be creative in how we address each individual site. So that's probably a good place to go. Uh, on your your reservations about the restrictions, um, we haven't discussed this in depth as a board, but I, I personally feel that there should be some protections for the, the stands of trees and, you know, the, 
the areas that are on the building lots that are currently serving as buffers both from old ocean house, or from ocean house road and from one of the abutters so uh, i'd like to see us craft some wording that satisfies that intent and maybe mm -hmm. maybe there's something else that can be added that would that would ease some of your your yeah, uh, i think we'd be in agreement that. Just kind of we, we've already done it here, <clears throat> and we can do it here. Um, but my concern is limiting the entire lot outside the building envelope to any clearing. I mean, if, if for instance, Jack, who's going to reside here, if he wants to remove that very tall spruce tree that's there now, um, with this note, he won't be allowed to do that. It's just, it's, it's just too well, much stricter. I guess I think that's a good thing. If somebody wants to cut down a really big tree that's a part of the site, maybe they shouldn't be able to just do it. Well, I mean, unless I it's diseased or you know harmful in some way. I guess that's your opinion. My opinion is, I you know, it, it, I think a, a property owner, <coughs> property owner, should have the right to do if he wants to remove a tree on his property, he should have the right to do it. Um, as long as he's not in there clear cutting. So it's a matter of degree really is I think what we're right. we're bouncing back and forth. Could I ask Maureen to maybe throw some ideas out? I suspect you have some, not to put you on the spot. Well before we get there, I <laughs> yeah, I think with, to address the abutters concern, I, I would be in favor of what the applicant has agreed to do, which is to have that restriction apply to the area to, I don't know, is it to the north of lot three? It's to the east, 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 where you just pointed out on the uh, the plan. I, I, I think that would be acceptable from my point of view. <coughs> Wait, go ahead. Well, the issue is we, you've had the applicant install building envelopes on each of the lots, but there's, building envelope is not a defined term in the ordinance, so you need to determine what that means because the next thing that happen is someone's going to come in and ask the code officer and he's going to look at me because there's not a note or anything on the plan that says, well, what's allowed in the building envelope and what's allowed outside the building envelope. So there has to be something that talks about it. I mean, you could just say that the, you know, the building envelope is where all the buildings have to be. Yeah. And everything else can happen outside of the building envelope. You have been in the past more restrictive and said that you can do anything outside the building envelope. but it has been, on the smaller lots, there has been a lot of problem with regrading issues where the building envelope's been filled up with a building and then the area outside the building envelope is encroached upon just to get the grade back to natural grade. So it, there's nothing that says you cannot say that you can do regrading in the building envelope. You could just, um, except for specific places like perhaps along Route 77 or along that eastern property line, um, put in the more restrictive, not allowing the removal of vegetation, um, but in the other areas only say that the building envelope means that's where the buildings have to go. Isn't that the common understanding of the term? I mean, you would be, yes, I know, but in, I'm sure from your own experience, <laughs> the common understanding of what a term means can you could spend a lot of time talking about that if you don't actually put it on, on the plan. Well, my concern is restricting too much activity outside the, quote, building envelope. I mean, the point of the rule is to define where the final product ends up, not to restrict the developers and the applicant's ability. It's my understanding of what they want to do up until the uh, building's ready for occupancy. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I don't understand why we're, we're restricting that. Uh, and you don't have to. Okay. All I'm asking is that you be clear about what is allowed and what isn't allowed and, and how you decide that is up to you. Okay. Well, just so, just so I'm clear, so <coughs> you, just, the concern that, that, uh, that created that restriction was that the building be within the building envelope and that grading not occur outside the building envelope? What? There have been plans that have been approved where the building envelope was intended to be a guaranteed buffer and that everything that was happening on the site had to occur within the building envelope. Meaning, so me the, meaning the final product or the work during the construction of the final product? 
Everything. So including the work. The only thing that happened outside, you obviously need to let people install a driveway because you need to get to the road. And we said the same thing for utilities. And then there was an issue about, well, you know, that tree's about to fall on my house and it's a health hazard. So we said, okay, you can remove, you know, hazardous vegetation. But the idea was to leave a natural buffer around every lot. As the town has uh, around every lot, or, or, or around outside every, the building, around envelope. every uh, around every lot outside the build, the, the exterior of the building envelope was the natural jungle-like area. So you couldn't, in theory, put your grass right up. No, you weren't supposed to do that. Okay, but However, that's not defined in the ordinance. It's anymore. not defined in the ordinance. It is a note on each subdivision plan. So you can take, for example, the Blueberry Ridge subdivision does not have that note on the plan because the lots are very compact mm. and it's just not a realistic way to design that particular subdivision. So building envelope is a concept that can be crafted, tailored to each individual subdivision. May I ask you, sure. what would you, how would you like to see the outside the building envelope restriction? I'm trying to understand, you have an issue with the way Maureen is phrased or, or the proposed restrictions, but I'm not, what, what problems do you foresee that using this language? That's what I'm having. Well, I, I outlined one here. I believe we're going to be into the outside the building envelope with grading. With due, this restriction? Due to the topography of the, the land with that restriction, right. Um, because, because you're going to be doing something other than what it says here. Correct. So, what are you going? What are you going to be doing? What could we add to this to cover that problem, so to speak? What could we do? Well, it, it, we the note says you can do these certain things: one, two, three, four. Tell me five, six, seven, eight, if it, it's as to what you want to be able to do in that area. Um, we we would want the ability to to grade, remove vegetation in grade outside the building envelope, except for those specified areas, this being one right. and this being the other. And, you know, um, I haven't consulted with my client, but um, I, would, I would say that we could, we could do it there also. Correct? Candace, I mean, th this, this lot is large enough so that that note works. These two lots, uh, well, this lot is really, we're taking care of that. It's, it's this lot, and we could do it there. Which is allow you to do grading in those areas. No, th this building envelope is large enough, and it, the existing residence is there, so we're not going to be required to go in and, and grade. But if, if the board wishes, we could restrict that area right there uh, of clearing. We wouldn't have a problem there. So we, we will take care of that. Maybe I'm missing something. You're saying apply this restriction just to those two areas, the, the west side of lot one and the north side of or south side of lot two, that's all? And this area. And the east side of lot three. Correct. Again, maybe I'm missing something. I thought that was the section that you said you needed some grading help. We will need to grade here. The back side, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I'm all set. Okay. David? So what I hear you saying, John, is that you would be willing to make a note on the plan stating that on the east side of lot three, south side of lot number two, and presently on the front of lot number one, uh, be restricted areas. Correct. And that terminology would be acceptable yes. to you. I, I, I would think that would be acceptable to me in this particular case. Well, let, let me just jump in on this issue because what Maureen mentioned before I do think could be an issue, and that is buffer between the, lot, the lots themselves. Um, there appears to be a buffer between lot three and lot 
two with stands of trees in between. There's a buffer between lot one and lot two. Um, and if I heard, Maureen, if I heard you correctly, that was one of the concerns in terms of restricting activity, so to speak, outside the building envelope because buffers in between lots can be taken down. Is that part of the problem? Um, if someday other people are, are living here and the buffers between the lots are, are taken down, I could see how that could be a concern. Now, I agree with you that, you know, to say you can't cut down a tree on your own property, I, I think, uh, might be a bit restrictive. But how about the issue of, of buffers not only from abutters, but in between the actual lots themselves? You refer you referred to this buffer here. Is that right. is that one of them? Yeah, that looks like one that that I believe is there to separate lots one and two. Yeah. And is outside the building envelope. All I'm getting at is, without any sort of restriction, that would not stop one of the whichever property line it falls under from taking all that down, and therefore there being no right. buffer between the houses. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the, the applicant's primary concern on this whole project has been to preserve the existing character of this property. And, um, you know, we've, we've laid this thing out, we've sited the homes, we've laid the road out to minimize the disruption of, of vegetation. Um, I guess it just goes back to being, it should, I think it's too restrictive for a cluster development to have that note apply to all areas. Well, that, that may be, and, and I don't doubt that the applicant would probably wish to keep things the way they are. Our job is to make sure that if it's somebody other than the applicant down the road that we still have the types of developments that the town has said we're supposed to have. And I guess my, my only point would be if, if this was a new three-lot development, and Maureen can correct me if I'm wrong, but there would be a requirement for buffers in between the lots, which couldn't be disturbed, correct? So that's the only analogy I'm making. And so that covenant, which may very well be too restrictive on the whole, I think if we're going to start modifying it, we all I'm saying is we do have to take into account that there still needs to be not only buffer between the road and the development and the development and the abutter, but also amongst the lots themselves, which would normally be the case in any sort of uh, development. Barbara. Well, I think, they, at least to me, the, the difficulty is in the wording of the removal of diseased or dying vegetation which might mean that you'd have a shrub that was three feet high and the, the owner decided to take it out and it became a problem. And maybe we need to say just removal of healthy trees and maybe define what we mean by a tree and that gives the, the property owner a lot more flexibility. I mean, I think we can be too restrictive and yet I understand that we need to be somewhat restrictive in trying to buffer lots. I think there's a good, there's a, I mean, all of this area here is in the common open space. I think that provides a, a, a more than adequate buffer between lots two and three. Um, most of the vegetation in this area here consists of uh, old apple trees um, and some shrubbery. I don't know if shrubbery was was considered as part of that uh, that restriction or not. 
once again, I, I think that we, I think that we've addressed the intent of that, uh, that note by preserving this, this area and this area here. Mr. Chairman? Yes. For the board's consideration, I'd like to propose a rewritten condition number two for discussion. Sure. That a note be added to the plans restricting activities outside the building envelope to installation of driveways, utilities, and removal of diseased or dying vegetation in the following locations. The east side of lot number three, the south side of lot number two, and the west side of lot number one. After I get my compass out, I'll figure out where all that is. It's the three locations that Mr. Mitchell has been speaking about. It's there basically a, a right number now. one. It's, and, am I wrong in directions? Anyway? No, I think the directions are right. Okay. Yeah, lot, lot one is west, did you say? Uh, yes. Okay. That would be the road frontage along Ocean House Road. It would be the back side of the existing residence. And getting away from the compass, the top side of lot number three. <laughs> it matches the compass yeah. down on the right hand side. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, what if, what if that revised condition were also um, worded to include the boundary between lots one and two? I think Mr. Mitchell's right. Lot three is fairly remote from lot two and you know, is fairly well buffered by open space, but there is a fairly short distance between the existing house and where the building envelope for lot one is. And that I think we'd be remiss not to do something to maintain a buffer there as well. We do have about a 55-foot to 60-foot buffer between the, the two proposed houses now, <coughs> between lot one and lot two. I think the right, vegetation will grow there on its own unless the applicant butted two front lawns to it. But, I, but I think the point is that without any sort of restriction, that's but is that possible. I have, I have no objection. Mr. Chairman, does that apply to just this applicant, or would that be a condition that would run to whoever purchases the property. That's the one that... It goes with the property, be my understanding. It's part of the recorded plan. No, I, I understand the three that uh, Mr. Carter proposed. It's just this latest one. You're, you're also suggesting that those conditions would restrict someone from running up the lawn up to the edge of the property line on lot number one on right. the uh, east side of the property. Right, which is what we do with every other development. We require buffers in between that can't be disturbed, usually within so many feet of the property line. We could say within 10 feet either side of the property line. And then up till there, obviously they can do whatever, whatever they would like. But I mean, let's just be clear, this is not a new concept. That we restrict people from taking out buffers in between. I, I understand that. I guess my concern between lots one and two is more Certainly the buffer that exists along 77 and Lot 1 is sort of woods, but it wasn't completely grown in, so to speak, in between the proposed Lot 1 and 2. It was more, the trees seemed more random, more spread out, and I could easily envision a landowner wanting a little more yard, so to speak, on that side, and not, you know, destroying the buffer in the area, but maybe taking down what's there and putting up a hedgerow. And from what I'm seeing, the restriction I'm seeing is that's going to be restricted. He would be the owner would be prohibited from doing that, and I'm not sure that's where the board wants to go. Because um, we're saying you can't take anything down that's on there. And well, it could be something said, better could, to be put in. You could limit it to 10 feet on either side of the property line, so at least gives the room out from the, the building envelope. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about taking things out and putting things in, then it's a whole other. Come back for site plan. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think old. that's a very good point. In fact, I, I, you know, as a as a landscape architect, I could envision if I lived here to maybe remove some of the over over overgrown shrubbery and trees that are there and and redo the landscaping. I I just think it's it's terribly restrictive of a homeowner to do that. Well, to no good end, really, in that respect. I'm right. Yeah, David. I'm wondering if we add into the list of 
permitted activities outside of the building envelope uh, the following. Uh, landscaping that does not material, materially alter or impair the existing buffer between the lots. Um, so you were talking about impairment. If you take something out but replace it with something new, yep. then that would yep. be okay. And, and, and that would just apply to everything, so we wouldn't have to accept out of this the, the north side of lot right. two and the east side of lot three or whatever it was. Well, it, the, I guess without being too uh, obstreperous here, I'd still like to see the restriction for where the abutter is because I think we have a concern there. Because sure. If we allow them to take it down and put something else up, then we're concerned with the abutter that's, that's I think Dave's there. language does cover that, though, as long as it doesn't materially change what's there. In other words, you can't thin it out, so to speak, but... Like John said, if you wanted to replace what was in between one and two, maybe maybe a more flexible approach to the whole idea that Mr. Sherman is suggesting is it might be the way to go. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that within the existing development. The, the only the two exceptions I would make are the buffer along Ocean House Road and the buffer along the abutters property, yeah. which I believe Mr. Mitchell said they wouldn't yeah. change anyway. And I think that's fine. Uh, but that way we have a more flexible approach for everything else within the development. Right. I, I think that's fine. I mean, my only concern was w without anything, somebody conceivably could take the entire buffer away and not replace it without any restriction. Um, Is that a I, that, 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 fine phrase? I agree with it. I just want to make sure we're doing something. Is that something the code officer can deal with? Yeah. Oh, yes. So how do you, how do you want the wording now? <laughs> do you want me to? C can you remember? Read it again? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yeah, why don't we why don't we hold off on that? Um, are there any other questions of the board of of the applicant on the other other issues? John. Yes, Dave. I just wanted to return to the width of the uh, roadway. Um, because that was the subject of a lot of discussion at our uh, site walk. Uh, I'll admit, I, I think what you're proposing makes perfect sense given the, the nature of, of this project. I'm a little reluctant to approve it, though, just because I'm afraid that the next time we get an applicant in front of us, they're going to say, well, gee, you did it for this one. How, why not for us? So uh, I, I just want to make it clear that we would be basing this waiver uh, on... Uh, at least what's important in my mind is the preservation of existing uh, trees. And is it part of your presentation tonight that, or the, the submission, that if we were to require the 20-foot width, that there would be existing trees that would have to be removed or their, their, their growth would be impaired? Either, either removed or more of an impact on their, their root system. Yes. And if it seems incredibly unlikely, would have more than three homes in this subdivision, but if for, for whatever reason another home were somehow fit into this, would the applicant agree that at that point the roadway would have to be enlarged? It seems to me one of the reasons we're considering the waiver is because there are only going to be three homes in there. Right. And then I guess the third possibility, again, which seems incredibly unlikely, is if this roadway connected to something else which seems impossible, but nevertheless, if it, somehow the street connected to an, another street yeah. through unforeseen circumstances would, would again want to have the, the width. I think, I think it is virtually impossible yeah. because this is all open, open space, part of, the, part of the development. But I think that that's a reasonable uh, uh, request. Because I just want to add those conditions. Are we writing them all down? I, I like those criteria. <laughs> okay. Hey, I have a question of Maureen. Um, r relative to the issue that we discussed about if the owners of the property decide that it's going to be, the roadway is going to be turned over to the town to be taken care of, is the wording in the letter 
uh, from the town engineer enough to uh, enforce that if that occurs, or do we need to put some wording in this uh, motion? If you want to make it um, a requirement that the road would have to be widened to the current standard if it was ever to be offered for the public to, to the, for the town to accept, you should probably put that as a note on the plan rather than reference the, the town engineer's letter because his letter is, is a recommendation. He's advising you. Um, you should also keep in mind that the actual acceptance of a road is an action by the town council, not by the planning board. So, so if I understood it correctly, if the town council accepted the road, then they would require it to be, meet the town standards? I expect they would, but... Okay. We can put that it on. That would be enough for me. <clears throat> okay. Um, other questions? Before we get to the motion phase, let me just see if I can sum up where we are. So we have a <laughs> census here. Um, I believe we spoke about, and, and how this is all going to be worded, I'll leave to others, but I believe we spoke about retaining the restrictive covenant that's included now for the portion of the property along Ocean House Road and the, I guess, the eastern side of the property where the abutter is. And I believe the applicant has no problem with leaving that buffer as is. Um, and then in terms of buffers between the lots, some sort of provision uh, where The, you, nothing can be done to materially, what was the word, alter? Or impair. Or impair. The existing buffers between the lots. Existing buffers between the lots, but, but does that infer that the existing buffer that's there now can't be modified? I think your idea, and frankly I, I have no problem with it, is they can take what's there and take it out and put something else in. Isn't that what we're, we've been talking about? That was about? the idea. I also would add, I don't know if Mr. Mitchell has a view on this, but maybe just something within 10 feet of the property line, because to me it wouldn't be fair to restrict the applicant all the way up to uh, the house or even the building envelope when we're talking about buffers. So whatever it is we decide, I would limit to 10 feet on either side of the property line. Is that, does that comport with what we're trying to do in terms of keeping the buffer. Um, and then we wanted a specific note on the plan if we are going to waive the width of the road that if it is ever turned over to the town as a public road that it must then conform to existing town standards. Did I miss anything? I thought we also wanted to include the condition that if there were another house to be built in this development right. to connect to this road for access purposes, that it would also have to be the width would also have to be enlarged. Existing, to, okay. All right. Barbara? That just seems so unlikely because you have so much open space that nothing can ever be built on. And then that front lot, it's almost unbuildable. Also, if another lot is ever built in that subdivision, it would have to come before the planning board for review as an amended subdivision plan, and at that time the planning board could address it. Yeah. I just assume make the condition now so we don't have to have this debate, but uh, maybe we ought not to tie the hands of the future planning boards. Uh, it's just that we're, we're try what I'm trying to do tonight is come up with some guidelines that would, would guide us in other projects. And we could, we could point to the fact that, well, in this particular one, it was important that it, there were only three houses, that it, it, uh, the existing trees were going to be impacted by the width of the roadway, et cetera. And I think it would be helpful to have that record uh, so that we provide guidance for future projects that come before us. Okay. Any other questions? I agree. 
Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Um, your clients, if they were to remove any of the buffer that we've been discussing, is it your expectation that they would actually hire someone like yourself to do a landscaping plan to replace or lay out a yard? I'll ask. Yes. The reason I was asking is I'm just trying to get the code officer out of trying to interpret what alter and pair would mean, and my suggestion would be that there be a condition if there were going to be any vegetation removed from outside the building envelope that there be a landscaping plan prepared that shows that an equivalent amount of buffer would be created. Right. Yep. Unless, of course, Mr. Mitchell, you want us to require that Mr. Brew hire you. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell has in the past come in with alternative landscaping plans that have been equivalent, and it's been easy to, to make that that judgment. That's why I think that it would work for the code officer to have to make that call um, if that's satisfactory to the board and the applicant. The only question I have is that would just be a review by the code enforcement officer. They wouldn't come back in front of us. Oh, thank you. And it would basically be, you know, they're taking down five trees sure. and go count and make sure they're going to put in five trees or equivalent. Or something equivalent. that's equivalent, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That, that, uh, that's a very good idea. Um, all right. Any other further questions or concerns? Who's the brave soul that's going to make the motion? I was all set until Maureen changed it on me. So. <laughs> She'll help you. Right, Maureen? Yes. I'll see what John comes up with. Anything changes in five days ago. I want to call to the board's attention that the applicant provided good, um, provided a, a new plan to me this afternoon, and it includes a note about lot one having a driveway only off of Arlington Lane. Um, so my suggestion would be that under the findings of fact, finding number five is no longer needed, and under the proposed motion, the proposed conditions, that condition number four is no longer needed. So Maureen, you're satisfied that, that the issue of the separate driveway has been <coughs> here? Yes, there's, there's a note I have on the plan right okay. here that says exactly. All right. So five is stricken. Yes. We, we didn't even get to that issue yet, but Mr. Mitchell took care of that beforehand. So. Um, I'm too, too confused. I just want to remind Dave who's writing the recommendation that under number one you have to add in with the exception of the condition of the road being complete. Under the town engineer's recommendation. Is that paragraph numbered? Barbara? It's number one. Oh, okay. It says the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter. We have to say with the exception of the requirement that the width of the road be requirement 20 Requirement number two in the town engineer's letter. Thank you. David. Right. Good catch. Thank you, Barbara.
Vielen Dank. Okay. Mr. Sherman usually gets paid a lot of money to do yeah. this, so we're very lucky to have <laughs> services. Move that we pay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, this could be done in stages. Uh, okay. Okay. Peter does have one, but um, we'll come on here, Dave. I'll wait for David. Okay. I have a motion for the board to consider findings of facts. One, Candace Carew is requesting minor subdivision review of a three lot subdivision located at 246 Ocean House Road, which requires review under section 16 2 3 of the subdivision ordinance. Two, the town engineer is recommending minor revisions to the plans to bring the subdivision design into compliance with town standards. Three, preservation of landscaping should be incorporated into the development of the lots. Four, the subdivision plan includes conservation of open space, which will be preserved through an easement deed. Five, the creation of a separate driveway to Ocean House Road. That's been deleted. Thank you. Excuse me. Strike that last comment. Five, the planning board by this vote grants waivers to road design standards to permit the construction of the subdivision road as depicted on the plans. Six, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Candace Carew for minor subdivision review of a three-lot subdivision located at 246 Ocean House Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One that the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated June 10, 2003, comma, with the exception of paragraph two of the town engineer's letter. Two, that a note be added to the plans restricting activities outside the building envelope. Excuse me. This is meant as a replacement. A replacement. Thank you. All right, two that any removal of vegetation outside the building envelope in the area east of lot three and along the route 77 frontage of lot one be prohibited and that any other vegetation removal outside the building envelope shall be accompanied by a landscaping replanting plan of an amount equivalent to the vegetation removed such plan to be submitted to the town's code enforcement officer for prior approval three that the conservation easement be approved and formed by the town attorney and signed by the applicant. And four, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plat. Okay. Is there a second for that motion before we discuss? Okay, a motion's been moved and seconded. We can discuss the motion. Mr. Chairman, should we also add uh, <clears throat> One more condition concerning the acceptance of the town road. Yes. Uh, the acceptance of the driveway of the town road in the future that it must be rebuilt to town standards at that time by the property owners. Yeah, I think we, we've talked about that. So will you accept that? Oh, certainly. Then, okay. I, I just thought, not to open up a whole other can of worms, but in terms of the uh, requirement about replacing landscaping and have a landscaping plan. I would limit that to within 10 feet of the property line so that it so that it goes to the issue of buffer as opposed to a tree near their house that they may want to 
take away or not take away. Just so I understand, you're saying move that restriction me. to just within 10 feet of the property lines, not from the edge of the building envelope to the property line. Is that? Yes. Okay. Is that, that's okay with everyone? Um, do we need to? so instead of uh, out, just read it real quick. <laughs> that any removal of vegetation outside the building envelope in the area east of lot three and along the Route 77 frontage of lot one be prohibited, and that any other removal uh, and that any other vegetation removal within 10 feet of the lot boundary lines. Right. Shall be accompanied by right. the landscaping. Right. Does that cover it? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. But it doesn't restrict what you can do up until up till there. Right. So the motion's been amended by Peter and again amended by David. Is that that's right. what's on the table? Right. Does everybody um, understand the motion? Or well, on behalf of the secretary, I just and I also want to defer to <laughs> either Peter, David, or John, the three attorneys on the board, because I'm just a simple painting contractor. <laughs> uh, in regards to condition number six, I would have some Maureen's help as to how that should be worded so that it doesn't become an administrative headache for either the code enforcement officer or our town planner. Is that all right, Maureen? Yeah. Okay. You will certify that there'll be no headaches. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, One other modification to the motion is that at least I would like to make it clear that if the number of homes within the subdivision increases that we would want the roadway to comply with the existing requirements of the ordinance. So if a fourth house were somehow squeezed in there, it'd have to widen or widen if the case may be if, if the ordinance indeed said 20 feet or 22. I don't think I agree with that. I don't think that that, that supposing that maybe something's going to happen down the line and in a, in a very unlikely situation and if the road were still private i think if the road becomes public then we have the right to say that we need it needs to meet town code and that we should just leave it alone that we're muddying the waters sorry but i don't agree but isn't peter's comment correct that if there were another house added to this it would come in the form of an amendment which would include because we're putting the restriction in a request to not have to put it back up. So I, I think if another house is added, we're looking at this again anyway. I, I guess I'm looking to just leave it up to the board at that point, one way or the other, to see whether it needs to go to town standards, um, stay the same, depending on the vegetation. I mean, there's so many variables. But I, I, I guess I agree with Dave in concept that we want to say that we're doing this waiver for this subdivision if somebody else comes forth with something else we'll look at it then my concern is setting a precedent I'm not gonna this is not such a huge issue that if the other board members aren't comfortable with that requirement I'm not gonna vote against uh, uh, this plan yeah I, I I think I agree with Peter that it, it's gonna come back to a planning board yeah, I'd agree with you Probably not us, and you know. Um, okay, uh, we have a proposed uh, further amendment. <laughs> number six. Is this number six? Okay. Is that Maureen just? Actually, it would become number five because the last one always has to be. Yes. All that other stuff yep. has to be done first. And we crossed out number four. You're correct. Right. Number five. Uh, that the road will be upgraded to town and local road standards if it is offered to the town for acceptance. Fine. You cover it? Sounds good. Okay. We have to At the risk of getting a no, does everybody understand the <laughs> yeah. motion as it now 
stands? Yes. Okay, it's already been moved and seconded, the amended motion. Oh, wait, no, we have to second again because we have a new, we essentially have a new second. I'll second the revised. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> All in favor of the revised motion? Opposed? The motion carries. Um, I would just like to thank the applicant, Ms. Carew, and Mr. Mitchell for working with us on this and being uh, very cooperative. Uh, thank you for your, for your input. Thank you all. All right. The uh, first item under new business is the Goldcrest Trails Resource Protection Permit request by the Town of Cape Elizabeth for a recess protection and RP3 permit to construct trails in wetland areas and a bridge across the Spurwink River on the Goldcrest property. Uh, Mr. Harding, town engineer, is here. Uh, if you can summarize the project for us, and we'll go from there. Thank you. I'm Steve Harding. I'm your town engineer. I also work for uh, Oast Associates. Uh, Oast has worked uh, quite a while on this project, uh, beginning way back when the town purchased the Gullcrest parcel, I'm going to say it. 1997, or that was to build the public works facility and the two recreational fields that we have out there along with the associated parking lot. And the third component of that was a passive recreational area with the remaining area of the Gullcrest Park. So this is a continuation of that effort. Uh, we went through with the Conservation Commission a very extensive master planning process for this trail system. Uh, we took a lot of public input, input both at the meetings and uh, at the council level and developed a master plan from which this current plan was developed from. Uh, for in front of you tonight for resource protection permit for impacts to RP1 and RP2 wetlands and an RP3 floodplain uh, around the Spurwink River. Uh, just to give you an overview, uh, this is a plan uh, that's in your package, it's the overall site plan, C101. Uh, basically, what we've shown here are the trails that, that you see in orange are the existing trails that uh, are currently in place at the Gull Crest and the surrounding area. Uh, basically to orient yourselves, this is the town center area where we have the schools, Route 77. Uh, we have Fowler Road coming across down through the bottom, Spurwink Avenue coming across here and Scott Dyer Road over here. The Gull Crest parcel itself sits uh, adjacent to the transfer station and it encompasses this area. We also have the, the town farm property across the Spurwink uh, Avenue. And we have undeveloped parcels that the town also owns between the Gullcrest and the municipal facilities. And the transfer station parcel, which includes the transfer station, and goes all the way over in this area to the Spurwink River. And then there's a small area here that the land trust in, um, owns, a parcel that part of our trail system would be going onto. The trails that we're showing in green down through here are the new trails that are being proposed. Uh, basically, the outer loop trail is predominantly on the transfer station lot. That's all in up, upland area in this area, uh, so that's not going to impact any of uh, the wetland areas. Uh, we have the, the Fowler Road connection down here, which has uh, been enabled to happen due to a private easement that the town has gained from a, a butter here on uh, Fowler Road. Uh, we also have improvements that are going to happen uh, to the outer loop trail in this portion. This area here is very wet. We have a boardwalk and three bridges that are going to happen here. We've got a knoll trail that cuts across here. Again, boardwalk and bridge, uh, bridge, excuse me, boardwalks through this area. 
and then the Spurwink River area that cuts through there, uh, cuts through across the Spurwink River, and that'll have a bridge and a boardwalk area. Uh, basically, what we're proposing is three, three basic types of boardwalks. We have what's been referred to as the rustic boardwalk treatment, which is basically log sleepers with two 12-inch uh, wide planks nailed to the sleepers, elevated slightly above the grade of the wetland. Uh, and then the other style is basically the two variations of it is more of an elevated boardwalk, 18 inches above the grade. Uh, this would be similar to some of the boardwalks which you've already approved, uh, one that the Boy Scout worked on here on the Outer Loop Trail and another in the inner, inner uh, excuse me, the Knoll Trail that was done as part of the Public Works facility. Uh, those boardwalks are going to be either four or six feet wide depending on their end use. Uh, there's two, types of, two styles of foundation. One is more of a sleeper arrangement on relatively firm ground, which would concern, consist of, uh, of uh, uh, beams placed on the ground, and then the boardwalk would be built over it. The second type is uh, what we're calling the style C, is more of a, it's called an anchor system, where we would actually put the supports into the soft ground and, and basically screw anchor these uh, supports in and then build a boardwalk on top of the, that feature. Uh, again, the specific trails that we're proposing, we have the, the robust, uh, excuse me, the rustic and the robust treatment across the Knoll Trail area. The uh, boardwalk in this area will be four feet wide. Uh, we've done that to prohibit the, or reduce the likelihood of a snowmobile going across here. We're also, as part of our state and federal permits, going to need to avoid and minimize our impacts, and this is one area where well, we felt the reduced width would be more appropriate to do here, and that we would be minimizing the, uh, the impacts of the wetlands. Uh, another four-foot wide section is the Fowler Road area. We're going to be going across that. In the easement that the town received from that, it, that's um, restricted to pedestrian use only, and that easement is in your packet. Um, so in that area, we've also proposed a four-foot wide area. We're proposing a six-foot wide area in the outer loop area, and if you've been out there, there, this is a trail that exists today. And in order to get through here, um, users have put down various treatments, uh, pallets. Uh, there's short sections of logs. What's happened here is in the winter, the snowmobiles get through here pretty decently. But as the seasons change and people try to go through here, uh, more, I'm not going to call it debris, but that's basically what it turns out to be. Uh, it's been laid down and people tend to try to hop around that and the trail is actually widening as people are trying to avoid the, the wetter areas in the middle. Uh, there's also three short sections of bridge in through here that we're going to replace. Uh, they total about 56 feet in total length, but uh, they're basically short sections that go over uh, small channels through this area. Uh, we're also proposing on the uh, Spurwink River Trail this would be a trail that's probably the most important piece of this. This connects this trail system to the trail system that already exists uh, in the, in the uh, town center area and also would allow people from the town center area to access this, these trail systems without going onto a public road. Uh, this trail system that goes across the Spurwink River is in an RP3 wetland. Uh, it features six foot wide boardwalk approaches to an eight foot wide bridge which would span over the Spurwink River. The bridge itself is about 20 feet long, would go over the Channel I section through here. Um, that's uh, an impact that um, will happen to a, a coastal section of the wetlands through here. Um, we've received permission from the land trust in order to build this section of, of road, uh, excuse me, this section of boardwalk onto that land trust parcel and that would tie into the town center trail. Uh, we are asking for several waivers uh, as part of this uh, as part of this process. Uh, we've asked for a waiver of the site plan scale. There's a minimum of one inch equals to a, equals 100 feet in the ordinance. Uh, we've asked that to be waived to one inch equals 200, which is what you see here now. Uh, we felt you didn't really lose any clarity by by making the scale bigger, and it's it really makes the trail system much clearer in relation to everything else that's around it and to put it on one plan we felt was more beneficial. Uh, we've asked for a, re a waiver on the topographic mapping. None of the improvements that we're going to do are going to require any, any regrading or, or, or uh, changing of the contours. We're simply building upon what's there now. Uh, we're also asking for a waiver of the high-intensity soils map. 
we have gone through the crosshatch areas on the plan are the, the wetlands areas. Um, basically, the boardwalks and the bridges are, are basically uh, addressing limitations with the existing soils, and we're going to overcome those by, through uh, these structural me measures. Um, we're also um, asking for a waiver of the wetland map based on hydrology. We've gone out, we've mapped the wetlands. Uh, specifically with this, this project in through here, we were more concerned with these edges of the wetlands. We've since gone out and gotten approximate locations, uh, more detailed locations where the trails actually happen and then approximate in between where the trail crossings occur. We've also gone through and studied the Fowler Road area and gotten a, a wetland delineation of that area. And we have an approximate area of the Spurwink River uh, limitation since we've had uh, our wetland specialists out there as well. And we're also asking for a waiver of the stormwater runoff uh, formal calculations. Uh, all the boardwalks are going to be elevated. We're basically not uh, changing any of the hydrology that's out there today. All the flow characteristics will remain the same. So we didn't feel that that would be a, an appropriate uh, step. And there's one other thing that I, I kind of skipped and I'd like to go back and mention is we're asking um, one of the one of the groups that was very vocal at the council level during the public hearing was the Nordic skiing uh, community, the cross-country skiers. And they've asked the commission to, to look at ways to, to make uh, these trails more accessible to cross-country skiing. The commission doesn't have any immediate plans to, to make these trails wider. Uh, basically, these trails exist today about a six-foot width. But they would like the ability in the future to widen these, if, if possible, to a 12-foot width in specific areas. And what we've done, we've estimated that that impact would be um, 3,650 feet, square feet. And what we've done is basically taken the length of the um, trails that are in wetland areas, which basically consist of the cross-cut trail through certain sections, the outer loop trail through here, here, oops, actually over here in these areas, and taken that and figured conservatively figured a 25% reduction of vegetation in that area. We don't think that that's really going to happen, but we'd like to ask for it, just to have the ability to do that. And if that was done, what you would see is uh, the commission going out and actually looking at these trails and looking for ways to, to make the trails wider without impacting vegetation. Uh, our total impact with the boardwalks and the bridges is 7,170 square feet for a total impact if you included that with a widening of 10,820 square feet. It's basically an alteration. It's not a situation where we are doing the filling or, or uh, any other um, man-made work. Um, so with that, it's basically an overview. I'd like to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Let me just remind the board that the first issue we have to vote on is completeness before we get into any substantive discussion and then determine if we want to schedule this for a public hearing. So if you could limit your questions or comments to completeness, and we can vote on that. <coughs> Since the town engineer believes that the application is complete, I think we can. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer a motion. Yes. Motion for completeness. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for a resource protection permit to construct trails and make trail improvements, including bridges and boardwalks on the Gulf Press property located on Spurwink Avenue, be deemed complete. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay. Opposed? None. Okay, the motion carries. Um, we have to determine, uh, I believe in the past we have had public hearing on any of these uh, proposed building or changes on the trail system. Isn't that right, Maureen? Usually yeah. when the town is involved. So um, we have to make a determination on that. But I would think. We would want to do that at the next meeting. David? Has it, has it been any interest other than some of the specific groups? I've had uh, two phone calls, one from a gentleman who um, 
said he supported the trail and was concerned um, about the construction of uh, bridges in wetlands when he couldn't expand his own home. Um, the second caller called merely to find out what was going on and was and volunteered to help construct the boardwalks. And I guess there's the added issue of the ability to widen the trails down the road um, and the issue of the skiers who may have an interest in that. Is that, is that in the current plan? Or? Yeah, that, that's in your application packet. Okay. Um, basically, and that, and that came from the public hearing that we held with the town council when we did the master plan. Mm -hmm. uh, there were several um, groups that spoke. Well, almost everybody was, every, actually everybody was in favor of it. They all had their specific interests though that they wanted to maintain. The small dealers had their, their right. ideas, the, the cross-country skiers had their and basically what you see here is kind of a, a plan that, tr that tries to address everybody and, and right. keeps those groups happy. Barbara. Since this is a town project, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't have a public hearing. So I think we should. I agree. I would agree with that. I would suggest that we don't need a site walk. I'm certainly familiar, as I suspect many of us are, with the property. Is that all right with everyone? It's OK. okay. We have a motion. May I ask one more question? Sure. Jeff, before we we're going to table anyway. Yeah. Um, with the inclusion in this application of a, up to 12 foot wide, does that mean that in the future, if the decision is made to actually widen the trail to 12 feet, that the boardwalks and bridges might have to be reconstructed wider than they are initially? No. Basically, the the boardwalks and bridges, when they get constructed, the idea is that they would be maintained that way for a very long period. If we go to 12 feet, that would basically be between the boardwalk sections. Um, there, there was some discussion where the Spurwick River crossed, whether that would, you know, some some point would want to make that wider. But basically, the commission felt that the 8-foot width was going to carry it through the future. And that was a reasonable width. You can't go so wide because you we still need to deal with these avoidance and minimization issues that the DEP and the Army Corps are going to to us to, to do. So you can't just pick a really wide area and just say that's what we want for any future use. And then there's a practicality of the construction. There's cost involved in it. So if the trails are ultimately constructed at six feet and then in the future there's a, a desire to widen the, the non-impact areas to 12 feet, what process would have to be gone through to do that, or is that just already covered? It would basically be coming up with the money and the will to do it? Yeah, it would be coming up with the money and then, you know, basically the commission, I, I think, would get very closely involved at that point um, and picking which of it, you know, would actually, I would assume that they would be out walking the trails and then saying, okay, this tree could be removed, or maybe if we shifted the trail over a little bit here, we wouldn't have to take out a tree. I think typically the commission's been very interested, at least in the projects I've worked on in saving vegetation. Again, there's no immediate plan to do this, but what we'd like to do is get the, get the basic concept uh, approved you know, through this process so that it could be done in the future. Thank you. I'd like to offer an additional motion on this. Others had questions? Go ahead. Be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular July 15, 2003 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you. It's another public hearing to add to the list on July 15. No, sir. Uh, the next issue is the request by Sprague Corporation for site plan review to construct the boat dock on the Spurwink River. Um, and we will be looking at site plan completeness. Thank you for your patience. Uh, my name is John Green. I'm representing the Sprague Corporation uh, with the application before you tonight give you a brief uh, summary of uh, our proposal. 
Uh, we are proposing to place a wooden dock on the Spurwink River. The dock consists of a 90-foot pier, six feet wide, set on three pairs of pilings, an aluminum ramp three feet wide by 50 feet long, and the ramp will connect the pier to a 10 by 20 foot float. Uh, the project requires us to meet the 17 site plan review requirements as well as the 10 shoreline standards. I've addressed this in the application for you. Uh, the project further requires a permit by rule from Maine DEP. I have met with a representative on site uh, with the DEP and uh, in early May and uh, the permit uh, by rule was granted and I have a copy of that with me tonight. I don't know if a copy was provided to the town. They said they had sent a copy but I'll, uh, I have a copy to, to present tonight if, if not. Uh, this is a seasonal dock and the rampant float will be removed from the water approximately uh, October 15th through April 15th of the year. The proposed dock will be located in a common area uh, as outlined in our 1999 Sprague Family Land Use Plan. This site has been and continues to be a boat launch, this family area, and is also a current base of operations for a local lobsterman. Um, that pretty much summarizes uh, the proposal and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Uh, again, I would remind the board that we have to deal with the issue of completeness first. So, anyone has any questions on that? Well, there was a comment about granting a waiver of requirement number four, which seems to make sense given the circumstances. Yes. All of the waivers requested, I think, are, seem uh, logical in light of the type of project. Barbara? I have a motion for the board to consider. Okay. Um, he had ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Spray Corporation to construct a boat dock in the Spur Inc. River be deemed complete. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Um, we obviously can, can discuss the substance of the application. Uh, we do have to determine whether we want to have a site walk and or public hearing on this uh, or if we want to address the application this evening, which we also can do. So, Andy. Mr. Chairman, I would submit to the board that given the uh, complete nature of the application, the fact that uh, it's completely surrounded by Sprague Corporation landowners, and, and to my knowledge, Maureen, there's been no public input on this, I would suggest we uh, not have a public hearing that we could move right for approval this evening. Anyone else? Yeah, Andy, I, I, would, I would certainly tend to agree with that. And as much as I would hate to miss the site walk in such a beautiful spot, I don't think that's necessary either. Um, John, so. I'll take you down there anytime you want to go. Okay, that's a deal. Uh, any questions of the applicant on, on the uh, application? David? There was, there was just one comment in the town uh, engineer's letter in paragraph two that uh, some of the dimensional standards of the dock were difficult to read and it was suggested that we review the proposed configuration to, to ensure that it complied and I'm just wondering if that issue has been dealt with. I can address that to the applicant or to more in. Um, I have not dealt with that. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer their, their uh, fairly well delineated on my plan. If there are any questions or things that are illegible, I'd be happy to point them out. I, uh, I think perhaps uh, it's fairly readable. Uh, I'm not sure specifically what was meant. Um, Would you be willing to make the numbers bigger so they're clearer? <laughs> I'd be happy to submit that, no problem. <laughs> that takes care of that. Just, 
Was it, was it your intention to get this project completed this summer? Uh, our hope was, uh, should we uh, pass muster tonight, that we would attempt to complete this sometime in July for use this year. Yeah, I, I would also add that since uh, this did require a DEP permit, and obviously they had to review it, and we've now been told that that permit's been issued, um, I see no reason why we can't act on this tonight. I'm going to ask one last question um, of Maureen. Uh, did the uh, permit by rule arrive at your office? I haven't seen it. Um, typically, those are sent to the code officer. So, if it did arrive in for I'll him provide, today, I'll provide an additional copy. Thank you. It can be a condition for approval, which will be satisfied within the next business day or two. Yeah, I think in the it's already in, the, it's in, in there. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Barbara, I have a motion for approval. Go right ahead. Um, motion for approval findings of fact the spray corporation is requesting site plan review and review for compliance with shoreland zoning standards of a proposed boat dock to be placed on the Spurwink river which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-8-2 shoreland zoning performance standards the project also requires a permit from the dep and three, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-8-2 shoreland zoning performance standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of, of the Spray Corporation to construct a boat dock on the Spurrent River be approved subject to the following condition, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until written evidence of the DEP permit has been provided to the town plan. Second. Motion has been made seconded. All in favor? Opposed? I have, I'm also in favor, just a little late. <laughs> <laughs> You've been counting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say our final item, but it isn't. My second to last item. <laughs> Uh, Leighton Farm Subdivision Amendment request by Wiley Enterprises for an amendment to previously approved Leighton Subdivision. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Owens McCullough, civil engineer with the firm of Sebago Technics, here tonight on behalf of Wiley Enterprises. I uh, hope that Patrick is with me tonight. Um, I think it wasn't very long ago that we were before the planning board for final plan approval for this project. Uh, and uh, we appreciate the board hearing the project and helping us move forward. Uh, Joel has started construction on the road. We got all our DEP permits in place and everything's off and running on it. As Joel started to move forward with the project, uh, Mr. Jordan uh, approached Joel and asked if he'd be willing to make a minor change to the uh, property line in the land that uh, he was going to, uh, that Joel was gonna purchase from it, which is uh, this piece of land over here. In your packets, I'll try to talk very loud. In your packets, there was an original property line that was configured like this for the open space. Mr. Jordan asked if we could uh, really run this line straight, which is really an extension of this line back here. And I think what he was trying to do is really sort of square it off more in a rectangular shape and put the triangle piece back here. His pond is, there's the edge of the pond back here. Uh, so Joel met with him and um, asked me to take a look at, at the plan and uh, Joel and I looked at it and really couldn't tell how it really changed the open space at all. Um, it's still the same land area, uh, still has all the same calculations for open space areas, uh, same type of land. Um, to tell you the truth, I wasn't really sure other than uh, that it really made any change to the plan at all uh, other than straightening out that property line which is what I think Mr. Jordan was looking to do. So in the spirit of cooperation, uh, Joel uh, offered to apply for an amended subdivision plan to only amend that line and go back to the planning board to see if that would be okay. And that is the only reason uh, we're back, really, is to accommodate a request by Mr. Jordan. Um, on, your, on the amended subdivision plan, 
Uh, you'll see in the title block it does read amended subdivision plan. There is a note 23 added to the plan that says this plan amends the Layton Farm subdivision plan dated 12202, last revised March 27th, 2003, which is the one the planning board approved. And uh, the amended plan includes property line modifications to the Jordan parcel to be conveyed to Wiley Enterprises LLC as open space. The net acreage and land uh, land area remain unchanged. It's still exactly the 6.84 acres of open space, same type of land, same characteristics, uh, just changing the property line slightly. Um, and that's really all we're here tonight uh, to seek that approval. Thank you. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Any? This looks to me, I, I suspect it does to all of us, like a pretty minimal thing. Would you just confirm for me that the shifting of the open space does not materially change in any way the buffering between either future homeowners in Layton Farms or current property owners in Cross Hill? Certainly. Um, the, that's an excellent question. The Cross Hill subdivision is over here, and this all around this piece is open space that's dedicated and now owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. And what this piece that we're adding, which is right here, will uh, will complement it that's already owned by the town. Joel will be giving that to the town also, so it'll just expand on the town open space. So there are no there are no direct abutters um, of any development adjacent to this open space. So that doesn't affect any properties around it. And the lots in Fitzpatrick's property all will have the same open space as before. The only change is really this triangular piece which was over here gets moved to over here. So as far as buffering goes, it'll from these lots it'll look exactly the same. The only difference is a piece next to the existing pond on Jordan's property. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Chairman, I have a motion. Go right ahead. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wiley Enterprises LLC for an amendment to a previously approved Layton Farm subdivision located off Wells Road to adjust the boundary line of the donated open space be approved, subject to the following condition. That the book and page recording information from the, for the original Layton Farm subdivision approval be added to the amended plan before the plan is signed and recorded. Uh, Fine. Let me go all the way back to the motion to consider. Yeah, the yeah. findings of fact. Okay. So the record is mm -hmm. complete. Preceding everything I just said. <laughs> motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, Wiley Enterprises LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Layton Farm subdivision to adjust the boundary line of the donated open space, which requires review under section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivision plans. Number two, subdivision amendments must include book and page recording information from the original subdivision approval. Number three, the plan substantially complies with section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivision plans. All right. So moved. We have a second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. The uh, last item on the agenda is the request by Peter and Jennifer McFarland for a private access way permit. And Good evening. 
Good evening, I'm Bob McDuff with Mitchell & Associates and here representing Jennifer and Peter McFarland for the private access way application. Uh, when we were before the board in March uh, with the workshop session, uh, we had shown the location of the private access way within the 50 foot right of way for the Paper Street portion of what was Hampton Road as part of the Weathersfield subdivision. Uh, and we pretty much maintained that same concept on the way through to avoid some of the board's concerns of restricting uh, impacts to the RP2 wetlands and some of the existing drainage on site. Uh, to give you a quick overview, because at the time we didn't have any boundary so we were working with the tax maps and uh, did not have any topography, and since then we have completed that work. Uh, the parcel sits back in here. Private acts, the uh, existing paper street runs down the full length of the property, terminating down where there's an existing drainage way that goes across the back. And there was a T turnout in here, which was part of the subdivision uh, approval, uh, subject for completion of turnaround in the event that the road was never continued through to the, the uh, adjacent parcel. Uh, this portion of the right of way is pretty much a successional type of growth really more of a shrub type layer and uh, small trees. There's an existing culvert that comes in from the storm drain system uh, off of Gladys Way, Gladys Road. It extends down to a point in here where it then opens up into a drainage way. It's been identified as RP2 wetlands around that drainage way. And it follows down to the rear of the property with an existing drainage pattern that runs across the back. There's a 20 foot wide drainage easement on the back of this particular parcel and it follows down along and then continues down in this direction here. The site itself, the building site, is primarily all mature wood cover. There's very little understory. It's mostly maple and oak uh, growth. There is some scattered spruce and some pine in there. Taking the board's comments, we pull the the house closer towards the front of the front of the property to avoid any impact of the yard. P2 wetlands, which is this area here, highlighted out in the aqua. And then there's a little wedge of RP2 wetland in here. Uh, the access drive, again, as I said, was held to within a 30-foot easement that runs down along here, pulls in to, for a driveway access here, and then the T turnaround actually is constructed uh, within the confines of that area. Uh, part of the application request was to reduce the width of the actual travel way to a 14-foot gravel uh, roadway with a 2-foot gravel shoulder to stabilize the grass. The gradient coming across this area in here is about a 6-7 foot grade change between the adjacent property owned by McGuire and coming down towards where that existing drainage way is. And as I stated earlier, we were trying to stay away from that drainage area and any impact of the RP2 wetlands. Uh, We've tried to preserve as much of the vegetation on site. There are some significant uh, maples and oaks that are on the front portion of the site, and we'll be looking at preserving that. Some of the existing vegetation, which is mixed right along the back part of the McGuire property. And then we've limited any clearing along the back side of where the RP2 wetland is, and actually within this area, which is not part of the RP2 wetland. The grades have been defined to minimize the overall impact. The rear of the house will have a walkout daylight basement to avoid any grade changes around the rear of the house in order to minimize any further impact to the, any impact of the wetland area in the back. I know that staff are here, you've probably seen there were some issues and concerns of the uh, right of way actually, uh, the private access way being located within the center of the 50 foot wide right of way. Um, we had Design this according to some of the planning board comments at the workshop session. And, uh, we have looked at trying to address as many of the issues uh, and willing to entertain discussion on the engineering staff comments. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer those. Um, again, uh, we will be first determining uh, completeness of. The application. So, if anyone has questions on that issue, uh, obviously there was a letter from town engineer that lists a number of items, some of which go to the issue of completeness, some of which do not. So, 
There are uh, three items listed in the uh, town planner's memorandum on the issue of completeness, and I'm just not sure I heard in your presentation whether all three of them had been addressed. I don't, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to review the memo. One was if there, a fire hydrant is not shown on the plan. Actually, there's a note on the plan. Uh, I believe it's on the grain plan, sheet three, which identifies that there is a fire hydrant within a thousand feet uh, going up Hampton Hampton Road. There is no fire hydrant in the immediate location of uh, it's just paper street. So I take it that would address that issue. Okay. And then uh, as far as the name for the private access way, is that all is that on the plan yet? Actually I uh, spoke with Chief Williams and we presented three names and I have not had an opportunity to review that with the uh, client they have submitted three names and uh, Merrill Lane was the one that uh, the chief accepted out of the three uh, that were proposed. So I take it by the time we come back for a public hearing, you'll have a name. Okay. Name. I'm not overly concerned about that particular issue as far as completeness goes. And then the last one was the plan was stamped by a registered landscape architect as opposed to a surveyor. Uh, again, I, Maureen, I take it that's a requirement that it be stamped by a surveyor as opposed to a landscape architect? Uh, the, the town engineer requests that. I believe that the applicant has stated that they have since had a okay. survey done and the next plan they submit will yeah, be stamped by the survey. Have the survey or stamp on. That it, in light of those three issues, I, I think I'd be prepared to offer a motion on completeness. I'm just curious about the creative numbering system here. C two seven. Oh, it, it relates to the public the private access way checklist. Okay. It's attached. So, yes, I, I do know how to count the number. I, I didn't put something in the software. Yeah. Barbara. Um, there's a note that it has nothing, well, this has nothing to do with completeness that the plan shows a building envelope which includes portions of the wetland and I can't find that on my plan at all. I can't find, no, I can't find that the building envelope is touching the wetland. It is. I think the clerk has shown me the setback areas uh, with the required building setback requirements and I had shown a dimension line off the rear of the structure being a minimum, I believe it's either 10 to 12 feet away from the edge of that RP2 wetland and Maureen just asked me to clarify that actual building window. There is no intent for any impact on that RP2 wetland. We'll just make it graphically clear. I'd confirm it. it it's, we're, we're both in agreement. It's just something about clean, cleaning up that one line. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Given that the the substantive issues deal with approval and not completeness, uh, and I suspect that there may be some commentary, or we could certainly anticipate some commentary from abutters because of the driveway being located off to the west. I'd like to make a motion for completeness uh, that we specify a public hearing at our next meeting where we can review the actual application on its merits, unless anyone else objects. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the fact presented, the application of Peter and Jennifer McFarland for a private access way permit for a lot located off of Gladys Road, U19-29, be deemed complete. Be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular July 15, 2003 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be held.
Um, the Maureen raised a good issue. Uh, good issue before we vote to table. The issue of the right of way should be discussed. So the applicant knows whether to change the plans and then come back. Um, I don't know if we're ready to delve into that. Can't hear you. Sorry. The, the issue of the right of way, the I issue covered in the, in the town engineer's letter on page two about uh, uh, centering the right of way to facilitate future improvements and possibly impacting more RP2 wetland, et cetera. Uh, if, if that's something that we want to endorse, then the applicant may want to know whether to revise their plans or not, as opposed to coming back after the public hearing and us saying, you know, we, we'd like that all changed, then come back in another, another month. So I'm sure the applicant would appreciate if we are yes. going along those lines um, to, to know that. I know it's getting late, but perhaps we can discuss that. Are we going to go out there? I, I think we need a, a site walk before. I think I need a site walk before I can say anything about that. Because I'm not really familiar with the area. Yeah. Yeah, as I, or maybe Maureen can jump in, but as I understand the concern of the town engineer, it, the suggestions really have more to do with if another lot is, is developed in the future and what the problems would be in, in you've, addressing You've got a 50-foot wide right-of-way, which is the same right-of-way as all the other roads down there. And in the past, the board has allowed applicants to shift roads slightly off-center, usually to save a large tree. Um, in this case, it's more off-center than you've ever seen before. Um, and the concern is that uh, if you're going to be building something down there, maybe you ought to be building something that is realistically able to be improved to a private road without having to relocate the whole thing at some point of date. Uh, there is another lot across the paper street from this lot that may also be buildable. And when that property owner tries to build in that lot, and I'm saying maybe build it because there could be wetlands on there to include development. I, we just don't know. Um, but if it is buildable, when that, when that person comes in there, they're going to have to come in for a private road. They're not going to be able to come in for another private access way permit. Um, and that means they've got to upgrade it to 22 feet. And at that point, you really start running out of right of way if you've slid this, this particular driveway over as far as you have. Um, the other issue is, and again, there's a good point there that uh, I was out there with the public works director and the uh, town engineer, and uh, with, with all due respect to wetlands of all shapes and sizes, this was not exactly the nicest, best, and most valuable wetland I've ever seen. It's very long, and it looks an awful lot like a drainage swale. So it just seemed like now may be the time to go in there and take care of this and design it in a manner that you normally would do. Um, and that's why I wanted the board to discuss this tonight. If you felt, if you were leaning in it one direction or the other, my expectation is the applicant would like to know that now. If you're not leaning in one direction or the other and you need to see it in the site, you see, you know, on site, then certainly you could do that and then try to give the applicant some direction. Yeah. I look at it this way. I agree with Barbara. It's hard for me to even begin to make an opinion one way or the other. And the developer or the applicant kind of has a choice at this point. If they want feedback from, from us and they're looking from me to wave to this, I'm not prepared to do that tonight. So the question is, you know, move the road and come back in July. Or if you want to try to persuade me that given those concerns that this is a good place to put that road. I can't see getting any feedback tonight. I see us going out there between now and the next meeting and having a detailed discussion on it. So, and I offer that choice only because of speed. Maybe they'd rather just move it and come back in July and present that to us, sort of removing that issue. We'll take the sidewalk anyway, but 
I don't know that I can be persuaded just looking at this without a sidewalk uh, that this is a good idea, and that's that's my opinion is to giving feedback at this point on that app, well, on this plan and what they're asking for. Yeah, I, just on the issue of the sidewalk, obviously we should have a sidewalk, but I guess my view is that. To me, the issue here is, and it certainly would come more into focus if you looked at it, but actually in, in just the abstract, the issue is if that other lot gets developed, you would be then putting another road next to this existing road and having two roads where one could, could do serve as, as the access way to both. In, in a nutshell, Maureen, isn't that what we're talking about? It would, it, would, it would almost be as much work as building a second road. You would, they would probably use the same right-of-way, but they would have to take it from 14 feet to 22 feet. Right. Um, so uh, it, it's an issue that, y yes, we might come into more focus when you see it, but it's still you're adding something that wouldn't necessarily need to be added if, if it was proposed the way the town engineer suggests. Now, that would involve, Maureen, uh, an additional permit, right? Yes. They'd, they would need a resource protection permit, which the board could uh, do that review concurrently with the private access way mm -hmm. permit. It could be granted concurrently. Okay. Well, let me ask the applicant. I mean, if other than the fact that it's you know, more work and an additional permit and all that. What, what are the what are the disadvantages from your standpoint of centering the uh, the right of way? I guess part of the concern I have one is the impact of what what's not only from the town perspective, but how DEP is going to interpret what that drainage way actually is, and that's one of the uh, comments that's raised by your town engineer in his review. Uh, since receiving this uh, contact at DEP, unfortunately, the individual I need to talk with and get out of the site is on vacation. So hopefully, <laughs> we will be able to get some sort of direction. The issue comes down, as I said, to whether or not they determine that as a stream and what sort of permit process we have to go through mm -hmm. to accommodate that. And that's probably the regulation aspect that uh, the hurdles we need to address. Obviously, the applicants are very desire to get going on this project as soon as possible. Uh, as far as re-engineering the roadway, this time involved in doing it, which we could probably be able to meet the submission date, but it does come down to impacts that this board needs to deal with and as well as how DEP is going to interpret some of those. Right. I guess the question is twofold. One is when could the board take a sidewalk? Um, it's the last Friday of the month. I believe it's June 27th. Perhaps we could schedule a site walk this week. I'm leaving town on Tuesday, so that would be great for me. About Saturday morning. What's the T ball schedule this week? <laughs> it's family fun day. That's it's Saturday, so we're we're free until about the start of the parade, which is ten. I do have a slight conflict as I am chairman of my own planning board and Kenny Buck and I have a slight work Saturday morning to attend. Myself. What about another day? What about either before work or after work on Thursday yeah. or Friday? Um. And I have to interject, I'm sorry, but Thursday I have a planning board conference, a workshop, public workshop for my planning board, so I'm kind of tight. Mm -hmm. the evening. I can do it in the early afternoon. Before first thing in the morning? First right, thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, which is fine. Yeah. I, I can or I can do it tomorrow. Friday morning? Friday. You can't do a Friday morning? I have right? a 7.30 meeting. If you'd like to go out before that, I'm all game. <laughs> Um, Did you say Thursday morning was no good for you? That's fine. What about Thursday morning? I can't do it Thursday, but you know what? what why don't you schedule for Thursday and, and I'll... Next Monday? I, 
Can everybody else do a Thursday morning? Yep. Uh, I'll I'll just get out there and, and so Thursday morning and take like a look. give these folks as much time as possible to make revisions should they choose to do so. Seven thirty. I'll defer to everybody. Seven thirty works. Seven thirty. Seven thirty on Thursday morning. How do you get there? How do you get there? Okay. Uh, I'll follow the road to Hampton. That's up. Go straight down into Hampton until you can't go any further. Right across. Um, well, I, I don't know if that if that's going to give you any indication and time to do anything one way or the other. But it looks like that's that well, we're, we're, we're going to need to see it. Two days Gives me Thursday and Friday the next week to, to address that. And, and there's enough out at the site to to give us some bearings, uh, flags, marks, whatever. Thank you. Okay. Well, no, what I was saying though is that if no, I understand that. Doesn't mean that at the site walk we're all going to say, you know, this is what you should do. So. I just didn't know what kind of shape the site was in. It's, as yeah. long as we can clearly find where they, they want to put the road, that's. Um, I, I guess if I were you, I would at least explore with the DEP what, if you can ever get, and I know how difficult it might be to get a, an answer out of them, but I, I would at least try to plan for all contingencies in case. That's the direction we go in. Um, okay. Did we already vote on complete? <laughs> no. And motion's been made, but not seconded. Oh, that's right. It's been. Well, actually, it was. We've moved in second. Moved in second. Okay. Everybody remember the motion? Yes. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Okay. None opposed. Uh, and do we have another motion? Chairman, if there's no other business before order, make a motion we adjourn. Well, I'd love to do that. We have one more. Okay. He the oh, he the tabling was in there. Yeah. Sorry, it was so long ago I forgot. Okay, Peter, we'll listen to your motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should we get the open <laughs> Thursday morning.